director of the Masters Academy of Art. I'm starting a new podcast called Unvarnished. In this podcast, I'll be visiting various artists' studios and giving people a glimpse into their world, a behind the scenes look into their own studios. They're talking about their own working methods, their motivations, their obstacles, their difficulties, their philosophies, uh, anything else we can think of talking about, uh, hopefully as unfiltered as possible. Uh, so stay tuned, uh, hope you enjoy. And today uh, it's gonna be episode one. I'm gonna go have a conversation with the artist, Katie Lydier.
so uh, we met in 2007 in Florence. We didn't really interact that much. Nope. Uh, I was in the advanced studios. You were in Casino, right? Yeah, I was in Casino. Um, Which was the so beginning our, studios. Yeah, days just didn't inter, uh, intersect all that right. much. Right, yeah. And uh, then when I came back to Utah in 2008, you came back in 2008 mm -hmm. too, right? Mm -hmm. I started the Massive Academy of Art, and you were one of the first students. Yep. And you, for, gosh, the first couple of years, it was just you and one other person. Yeah. I mean, well, there was like, there was... Yeah, there were people kind Justin of in and out, and but... Tyler and sure. whatever, but, but you and that other guy was... Yeah, <laughs> that, really that other only, guy. <laughs> really the only yeah. uh, two students there for a while. Yeah. Um, but you guys were pretty hardcore. I, I could have been more hardcore, but there were issues. So. There were there were issues, yeah. Um, and then you turned around and started teaching for us, mm -hmm. and uh, now you're off on your own in the big wide world. I'm doing my thing in my little doing studio slash nursery. And you just had your first kid. I just had my first kid, yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy, because as you know, motherhood was never on my agenda never <laughs> so no and in fact it was adamantly not correct on your agenda. <laughs> right 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 but here i am so yeah. well you did good it's a good one you made a good one he he's a pretty boy and i as an artist was really worried that i would have an ugly kid <laughs> <laughs> and then what do i do with that you know like well you don't paint it oh well right but then you still have to like see it you know and that's not fun <laughs> But true, <laughs> like if I can't, if I can't look at my son and be like, I really like looking at your face. You would like it no I, matter what. Probably. And maybe everyone's lying to me that I actually do have an ugly baby, you, no. but it's just me. No, he's, he's a cute baby. He is a cute baby. Yeah. And now we are in the midst of a global pandemic yes we are so we so are you're, actually you're staying home anyway i'm staying home uh, i nothing really has changed, nothing for, has changed me. for you <laughs> yeah most artists are yeah, day to day <laughs> self quarantine yeah anyway. if anything we're too close here in this space you and me yeah yeah, yeah. well probably i think we're only like three feet apart we should be six feet we apart we really should but oh well so um yeah, that's the briefest of histories. Yeah, that's your. That's my history f with you. Sure. But yeah. um, yep. tell me, what was the beginning of? Um, I mean, when do you remember first wanting to be an artist? When when were you growing up? Uh, what kind of influences did you have? Whether it was teachers or other people in your family that that started you down this whole path of being an artist? I from. The time I was really, really little, I knew I wanted to be an artist. And it was kind of a weird thing because I never really considered really anything else. I don't know why. I mean, I, I'm really interested in other things, but it never felt right to be anything other than a painter. So mm. I, in my first grade journal... Like how old? What do you mean really little? I mean, I have drawings from kindergarten that... Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The people would be like, that's a little advanced for a kindergartner. Scribblings, of sure. course, but still. Um, but in my first grade little class journal that they would have you write for to uh, practice writing, the topic of the day was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I wrote down, I want to be a gallery artist. That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So I, I still have that somewhere. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, and I remember thinking very clearly in my mind, I want my artwork, and I I saw still lifes actually at that time, on a gallery wall. That's it's crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. You didn't have. Did you have any family? Did you have no. teachers that like planted <laughs> seeds? No, my, no, nothing like that. The only artist in my family is my great grandma, who I never met. Minerva Tykert. <laughs> <laughs> My great grandma. I, I think I think that was who it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, she's nobody. Um, but she went crazy. But she did a lot of pastels, and, and mm. so there's some pastels in the family. But, but other when than you that, were little, you probably weren't really aware of that. No. As much, right? Oh heavens no. So this no. is just. Yeah. This is just. Yeah, who I'm. You were. I'm definitely the black sheep of the family. 
100 percent. we all feel like that <laughs> that you're the black sheep. right we all right feel like right, that. Yeah. right right i've talked to your parents and they, they, well <laughs> they, they say the same thing sure. um so so you kind of had that trajectory early on mm-hmm. and then you went to snow college went to snow college yep and why well i went to snow college for two reasons one it was cheap and two, it got me out of my mother's house. I didn't have in any... Bountiful, right? You grew it, up in Centerville, Centerville, yeah, yeah, um, here in Utah. Um, but yeah, I I had no other motive behind going there except for those two reasons, because I wanted to go up to Utah State because I had always heard, oh, they have a great art program. Yeah, I heard that too. Um, and so I'm like, okay, well, I'll get my two year degree down at Snow, and then go up to Utah State. But that's not obviously how it happened because I had a professor down there um, who told me about the academies and immediately... You had a professor... At uh, Snow. At Snow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, And immediately when he showed me the work that was coming out of the Florence Academy, especially... um, Scott Allred. Scott Allred, yeah. um, I, I knew that that's exactly what I wanted to be doing. Yeah. I didn't know before then. I, I had this vague kind of understanding that I leaned more representational than abstract because abstraction through all of my art classes just never really clicked for me. I never really understood the point. Um, and so I knew that being more representational, um, and even then, uh, for some reason, still life just kind of clicked still. Um, and so I, yeah, I said, well, this is where I got to go. And, and stupid me. Yeah, stupid me. I'm like, okay, here I go. Yeah, that was my experience yeah. too because I came out of BYU and somebody told me about the Florence Academy. This is 2001, 2002. Uh, I was aware of Jacob Collins as well, the Water mm-hmm. Street. But um, Florence seemed easier for some reason, even though I'd never <laughs> been there. It's easier than New York. Interesting. And if I had known about New York, I, I may have considered it, but I, I didn't know. Yeah, I, I knew about both of them, but, but I applied to Florence thinking, why not? It's, why not? Why not live in Florence, right? Who wouldn't want to? Right. And then I got accepted, and then like I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> now what? I got to go. I got to right. go yeah. do this. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was a total unknown. I mean, what 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 made us think we could? Right. Do yeah. It? Yeah. Looking back, I was incredibly naive. Yeah. Thank Incre- goodness. Right. right. Yeah. I was so stupid, and somehow my mom let me do this. Yeah. You know, I I traveled all by myself internationally for the first time. At whatever age. That I was went. your first. time? That was my first time. Wow. Yeah. And okay, here I go. And I had no plans when I went uh when i got into rome on how i was going to get to florence i had no idea <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> i was just so dumb and yeah. there wasn't really internet back then to kind of well i mean there was internet but i didn't really know how to look it up and uh and we didn't have internet at home so it what, was, what year would that have been that was 2006 yeah internet was pretty young then yeah when i when i looked at it in 2002 yeah it was like nobody'd heard of it the right. internet i yeah. think they had a website but it wasn't very good right. and, yeah um honestly and the, the thing information on there. that leaned me toward florence academy instead of angel academy was um their website <laughs> it was better yeah. than the angel academy that's interesting these are falling down yeah but so you moved, you went there, you went there twice though, right? You went in 2006. Yeah. Ran out of came money. Back, yeah. Went back in 2007. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Somewhere, something along those lines. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, ju- I just ran out of money and so had to but go that's, back that's and work. That's pretty significant because, um, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to do that in the first place. You run out of money, you come mm-hmm. home, you get reacclimated to being home, you have some skills that you developed. Mm-hmm. You probably felt like uh, you're you're an artist. I've already got Snow College. I've done mm-hmm. this now. Mm-hmm. Um, you could have just stayed home and 
like gone for it. You could have just been yeah. like, all right, I have enough. Let's let's start making art. And it instead was, you yeah. save up money yeah. and you go back to Florence. Yeah, it was really tough, especially since I was living at home with my mom again. I was a full grown adult at this point. I was living at home with my mom, working at the Target down the street so that I didn't have to buy a car. I didn't have a cell phone. And my boyfriend, whom we were really close to getting engaged, lived two hours away. Oh, he was still down at in yeah, Ephraim. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. And so it was tough. Yeah. <laughs> but, and and the decision was, do we get married or do I use this money to go back? Um, ultimately, I figured, you know what? I have to go back. I have to. There's no way that I can, knowing what I know now yeah. about how much I don't know, not go back. Isn't that the first the first thing that happens in Florence yeah. is you get smacked with yeah. like how yeah. little you actually know. Yeah. It was it was hurtful. Yeah. <laughs> there were plenty of days where I was just crying at the end, just I can't do this. Why am I here? Yeah. Um, but it was very, very good yeah. for me. So you go back, when mm -hmm. you came back you studied, uh or, or you kept going. Mm -hmm. Uh with us at the master's academy mm -hmm. and um i don't want to dwell on the education too much but what do you feel like um i mean what was the what were the things that you felt like made your education um who you are or, or what in your education kind of helped you move in the direction develop in the direction the skills that you developed um, but what are also, what would you say would, are some of the pitfalls of your education? Um, well, the academies are very, this, I don't know, from my perspective, I think this is the way, this is the only way. Um, and anyone who does anything differently is wrong. Yeah. I don't know if that's kind of changing now. I think that... I don't think it is. No, <laughs> no it's still the same. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, but... Yeah, that it's hard to overcome that when it's constantly in your face. Yeah, um, it's like a it's like a cult or a religion. Right. Yeah. You just buy all in. Right. Like, yeah. This is yeah. It, this is the truth. The, yeah. Well, because it felt like, oh my gosh, I finally found what I've been missing, and okay, so everything that you're offering, I'm buying. Yeah. Basically, um, and so weeding through that took some years for yeah. sure. And I'm definitely, and I think in my work, it shows that some abstraction is kind of necessary in my work. Right. And I'm completely open to that. And uh, I think that it makes it stronger in a way than some of them that are just totally all about basically making a cast, you know, in whatever still life form, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, basically rendering what's right. in front of you rather than interpreting what's right. in front of you. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that that took some years um, for me to accept because I, I kind of felt it, but I didn't want to accept it. And and so just to allow myself to say, you know what, this is how I paint. This is yeah. how I interact with my subjects. And there's reasons why I do that. Yeah. And it makes my work stronger because of it. And there's a there's a freedom in your work that um, when you were studying, I remember seeing glimpses of uh, that personality coming out. Mm -hmm. But there, but the when you're studying, there's such a um, an emphasis on just trying to get better, trying mm -hmm. to learn how to turn form a little bit better, understanding the mechanics of. Um, how to make something feel right, look right, uh, how to get your proportions, how to uh, make something feel like it has weight and volume. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so much focus being on the mechanics of uh, making this look like that. Often there's not room early on, especially early to middle education to to think much about interpretation sure. or feeling or emotion or yeah. um which is important what you want to say with your thing yeah. it's it's really just how much better can i make this look like right. that right. than i did on the last one right 
Um, but I, I think a lot of students end up adopting that for right. years after right. as the art. It's, it's all about how well can I render this right. uh, um, uh, rather than anything interpretive. And, and it, it feels like um, it's, it almost, I, I don't think it's necessarily talked about like this in the academies, but it does kind of come across in the culture that um, interpretation, being led by emotion, uh, um, being led by concept, isn't, it's never discussed. And so mm -hmm, right. um, to, to almost allow yourself the license to change something or to interpret it in a different, in, in a way yeah. that isn't observed, right. but it's felt, right. um, that, that's, not, that doesn't always happen, right? right. I mean, they're, not every artist yeah. makes that um, yeah. shift and I feel or allows like, themselves that freedom. Right. But yeah. since you graduated and started making your own work, um, I feel like not only have you given yourself that license, but your work is governed by that freedom. I, I feel like I need to go farther, honestly. Yeah. I, I feel like sometimes I still get in that pitfall of, Oh, I'm I'm just trying to render instead of I'm interpreting. Yeah. Um, I, the painting by you actually, I felt that really heavily. Should um, we pull it out? Sure, if you want. This is what I'm trying to do with this podcast. This is why we're videotaping it, so we can actually show what we're talking about. I don't know the best way to get this. On. I don't know either. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're gonna be upset with me when you hear what's underneath that painting, though. Oh, just don't tell me. Okay. <laughs> I have a terrible habit of painting over my paintings. Okay. All right, show this. There you go. There you go. Yeah, so um, these bottles especially, I was just like, well, and I got caught up in this fur uh, because fur is difficult I hope this, for me. we can see this. Yeah, hopefully. I don't know if it's um, If be not, it's on my website. But... But it's really easy to get caught up in, in you know, the form and the glare and the reflections, et cetera, et cetera, um, and, and trying just to turn form instead of overall harmonies. This bottle unifies really nicely with the tones in the copper, which unifies really nicely with the leaves, um, and some of the branches here in the nest unify with, with the branches or, you know, the willow branches and the the jars again it, you know trying to pull that all together and focus on that is a lot harder um when you're in your day-to-day -day in front of it yeah so trying to paint it so that's touches on something that i've really uh, found hugely important in my working method which is um making decisions relative to the painting right. versus the Right. Whatever uh, uh, source material. Right. right. Yeah. There's this big movement. I'm going to set this down. Yeah. There's this big movement or conversation, especially academically, not only academically, it's it's in other places, too. But this only from life concept. Right. And uh, for me. Silly. I, yeah. Well, me, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's very limiting, but uh, for, but at the same time. To each his own. Uh, sure. Do, do whatever you're going to do. Absolutely. Um, but I think that for me, uh, the difference was when I put the source material away, whether that's working from life, whether it's photography, whether it's sketches, whatever. Um, what I was able to do was just focus on the needs of the painting. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm working mostly from imagination mm -hmm. or memory. Um, but the the platform from which I'm making decisions is purely based on looking at the painting and trying to figure out right. what the painting needs. So when you're right. working from life, which I think you do most, most of oh, the yeah. time, oh, yeah. um, get separating that uh, mentally, because again, we're going back to mm -hmm. your training, which was all from life mm -hmm. and you put something in front of you and the whole, the whole idea was to make this look like that. Right. Um, so how did you, get past that mentality, that more student mentality of um, just rendering or just solving relative to whether or not you're capturing right. uh, um, observationally right. the thing versus yeah. 
I'm trying to turn that corner from a well-observed, well-rendered subject to a work of art. Sure. Um, I don't... Because your, your still lifes are so not the typical uh, um, shadow box still life. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Even though good. I know you've... <laughs> For me, that's good. You've felt like that. And we've had right. conversations before where you right. have that sort of nervousness about right. being a still life painter and right. um, um, it, it being mundane or um, um, too contrived right. or whatever. But I don't feel like that at all with your work. In fact the opposite i feel like you've really just w gone way beyond um hmm. the that shadow box still life hmm. uh student rendering to something just richly artistic well i appreciate the co the uh compliments <laughs> but but i feel like i can push it more because it's still very representational of what was in front of me with my own spin on it, I guess. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Well, you're talking about uh, really considering the right. unification yeah. of the yeah. colors, the harmonies, right. whatever. So, yeah. I mean, that in itself is sure. an interpretation. Right. That, that's a, a purposeful design element, not right. just a, a observational. So. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm constantly in my mind trying to figure out how much does this actually need? What can I get away with not including? Um, which of course editing is like stage one of being a professional, right? Learning how to edit your work, uh, to say exactly what you need to say in the most clear, concise way that you can say it. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that's constantly in my head. How much can I put down? How much can I get away with not putting down? Um, and understanding that, I guess it, being open to that idea in my work yeah. was, I think, what kind of turned it for me. Instead of, oh, I see that little lump or bump, I have to put it in. Yeah. Uh, do I? Let's put it in. Let's see. Uh, turns out I don't, yeah. <laughs> you know, type thing. Um, and that's kind of progressed as the months and years have gone on. Like, oh, you know, I, I didn't put it in last time probably don't need it this time yeah I, I paint a lot of the same objects over and over again i mean any still life painter is going to have their collection right. um and so understanding each item um understanding how they all harmonize together because again every still life painter they collect the items that they collect based on whatever pulls them to that item right but it's probably going to be pretty similar from item to item in terms of a common thread right um i would imagine because that's what it is for me sure. and for me you can see um i have a lot of like natural type items um kind of more i guess natural toned and and whatever and so they work really easily together in terms of color harmony and and i can just grab something and, and put it together and i know exactly what one thing will work well with another thing which um will work well with another thing i feel like i'm gonna turn this on i'm gonna take this off sorry it has a it's a little lullaby i think this is the joys of having a nursery as a studio <laughs> That's one thing I never had to deal with. I don't know how to do it. Greg Mortensen was, he does, he as well, was, yeah. he would stay home with the kids and yeah. then paint at night. There's a, a hilarious photo he posted once because um, he has a, on his, on that bedroom door, there, it's a glass, mm. um, there's a window in it. And uh, his, his kids, he would close the door so he could work at night. When it, Once his wife got home and there's a photo of his kids like, pressed up against the glass crying because oh, he's oh my gosh it's, it's the saddest thing but I, that's uh that's a whole another world that I, I never really had to deal with but it's, yeah it's i'm sure that's yeah fine. we'll talk we'll talk more about yeah. that later because i want to know really how how it's flipped your world upside down but oh, um gosh, yeah but yeah um so, so that shift in your thinking i yeah. i really feel like is um I think it's it something that my confidence, honestly, it, my right. the and shift it... in my confidence. Okay. And allowing myself to actually just have all of those thoughts that were in the back of my mind come forward. Yeah, you just you just gain that freedom because yeah. when you were at the school, uh, um, there were things we don't have to no we, necessarily we, yeah, get into, but <laughs> right. but it uh, there were there were times where. Um, 
for extended periods, uh, you had confidence shaking right. experience where, right. that really, I think, undermined your ability to just make the work and, yeah. and believe in yourself right. with it. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, when you graduated and you were teaching and we got rid of this negative element that was uh, um, really the cause of all that, uh, right. you in the studio, you were developing confidence but slowly and i feel right. like um from my end when you graduated i i immediately just became a fan uh, <laughs> i was um super excited to see what you're going to do but i think because you were still in the studio and right. we were working kind of there together and there right. was that teacher student dynamic right uh you still had that feeling of constantly being critiqued and watched right. over and, right. and yeah. uh and so when you left it was like all of that was yeah. gone. You yeah. were on your own. You could just, uh, uh, you didn't feel constantly uh, the weight of those eyes on yeah. you, yeah. Uh, judging and critiquing. Mm -hmm. um, and you just yeah, exploded. Just it was yeah. uh, um, amazing the, the yeah. change that happened. It, it was really surprising to me, the weight that I really literally felt off my shoulders. All of those terrible ideas and, and terrible voices that were in my head um, every day when I went into the studio, which were all contrived by myself, yeah. um, they were all of a sudden gone. Yeah. And it was ultimate freedom, really, at that point. Uh, and I'm still exploring that freedom, honestly, to see how far I can push it yeah. and still make it work, I guess. Because yeah. <laughs> you know? one day I'm going to go too far and it's going to be like, mm, Katie, that's a... Uh... That's probably not your best, and that's yeah. okay. But I think I think that's a, the kind of not only is it uh, does it have to be confidence driven um, that that sort of freedom you're talking about, but it it's pretty ballsy too. I mean, you sure. have to you have to really be willing to take risks and go to places where you're super uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You have to. Um, experiment beyond the bounds of your training you have to uh, let go of the old ideas you were spoon-fed uh, right. of this is what good looks like and right. it's only successful if it has this or whatever and you're um, I think you're you're doing that in a way that uh, I think is unique and uh I Especially in the academic world, this. right? I mean, um, I, you're you're a big fan, and you've always been a big fan, but only I feel because I was your student. But <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's a little a little prideful moment for you to see. No, no, no. My no. Work, I it, no, I I don't feel any of that. That <laughs> your six, I really have no uh, um, um, feeling of ownership of over any of your success. In, in the least, it's more about. Uh, I think my the joy of it for me is I felt like I, I felt like I saw it in the beginning mm -hmm. and I got to watch it come mm -hmm. out for so long and I have like an intimate look mm -hmm. into or or, or uh, a more intimate uh, connection to your work than maybe most people mm -hmm. would just sure. because I get I've seen it for so long sure. I've seen it develop I, I get to see you mature into something that. Um, I felt like was always there, but it's so unexpected to me now. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I knew the skill was there. I knew the dedication was there. But what you're painting, I never would have been able mm -hmm. to uh, predict. Uh, it. It's, And it's so outside of anything that I would ever right. do, right? Yeah. I mean, it yeah. has nothing. To, I don't, I could never have taught you any of this stuff. Sure. Um, and that's what's exciting for me is you have... Well, that's kind of the point, such a though, distinct isn't it? personality yeah well that's the hope i mean i'm i'm hoping to teach in a way that makes people feel uh, a, a freedom that that they can right. follow whatever yeah. and do whatever and the fact that you're doing something so outside of what i would even conceive of is uh, that's good i mean yeah. i, I that that part makes me feel good because I at least didn't shackle you to a, a, right, a method right, or whatever. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but it, ultimately it's, it's, it takes a lot of willingness to be uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's amazing yeah. that you can 
it it really though i i do think um that it it calls into your your method of teaching um, that it's valid because I would get asked when I first started painting at least, do you paint like Ryan? And I I didn't know because I hadn't painted enough, you know. Yeah. Um, but I can definitely say no, I don't paint like you. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of the schools they all look very very similar. Maybe not completely the same, but very, very similar. Um, you can tell kind of where they went based on their work without knowing anything sure. about them, unfortunately. Uh, and I think that potentially some students are breaking free of that, um, maybe the bigger names, but but there are unfortunately a lot of students that can't. Yeah. And that's that's too bad. It is one of the, um, one of the benefits and draw drawbacks of any academic training right. is it, you, you're the rate at which you get better, the the economy with which you learn uh, the, the fundamentals of drawing and painting is so much faster. Right. It's, uh, right. it, it allows you to learn and develop these skills so much faster. Yeah. But it does come with kind of an absolute that says, you know, you, you do it this way and it looks like this in the end. Right. And um, so the benefit, excuse me, is the economy. The drawback is... Um, you're giving, you're kind of saying, here's step one, two, and three. Right. So, and it is rare that people come out and um, decide, I'm going to, I'm going to let go of that um, right. largely and use the principles, use the skills, but let go of a, a lot of the sort of naive uh, uh, um, student mentality concepts, you know, mm -hmm. silly things like never use black, which right. they don't actually say in the academies, but right. um silly ideas like right. that that we hold on to or never this use a own, photograph <laughs> or never use a photograph or or you I, know, shun. I, I do want to be clear though just in case anyone listens to this and is like well i'm i only work from life good for you that's yeah. great but don't be down on people who don't yeah you know i i don't care how your working method is I care about your work. Yeah, so absolutely. Just let people work the way they work. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, does it? Uh, does a painting you love lose credibility if you find out it was made in a way that you didn't expect it to be? Right. Uh, or, or does it really matter? It doesn't matter. You should just love the work matter. that you love, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, let's see. What do I? What do I? <laughs> this is this is our first podcast, yes. and I hate these lull <laughs> moments when they're like, um, "Now what?" Right. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about your the philosophy behind what you do. What your um, I, I guess what motivates you. We're kind of touching on it now with mm -hmm. this with with you expanding beyond your training, um, but. Again, to, to go back to my interpretation of your work, it does feel so much more concept driven. It feels um, it feels like there's such a, a distinct personality in it, and it it kind of reminds me of uh, Emil Carlson's work or um, Chardin, where it. I don't want to put you. you uh, I don't, I don't want to <laughs> go, go too far, or put too much yeah, pressure on you, but. Uh. <laughs> uh, I, it it just has a, a poetry to it mm -hmm. that is so beyond um, the typical still life. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, what is the what what do you feel like is the motivator behind that? Um, and again, I, I I look at it in terms of of uh, good rendering versus um, or I, I guess I look at it in terms of representation versus art. Mm -hmm. And I feel sure. like you're making art. And the, and the art to me is has more purpose. It has more uh, of the artist's deliberate purpose mm. behind it rather than just the purpose being the or the message being, look how well I can render. Sure. What what do you feel like is going on in your head as you're making these paintings, as you're designing a setup mm -hmm. um, when you're making the editing decisions? Because that's mm -hmm. such a huge part mm -hmm. of it. Um, and, and I, again, I feel like you tip those scales over to the art side, mm -hmm. uh, the fine, you know, rich, uh, artistic poetry. Mm. Um, 
what do you think what what do you what is your philosophy here (laughs) to these people who don't know me no they'll find out if they're not aware already (laughs) just look at the work um i have always been drawn to beautiful things and and i've been always been drawn to like nature i love gardening i'm a huge animal lover um i love just being outside enjoying the sunshine enjoying the moonlight whatever um and I feel like that's why I choose what I choose it, to paint. Um, and that's why they kind of have a common thread. Um, but it's just what's beautiful to me. And I feel like nature is the ultimate beauty, right? Um, and so if I can somehow capture what I feel when I'm looking at, or when I'm just enjoying a, a nice spring day, a just beautiful day out there and going outside, just feeling that sun, that's a great feeling. If I can somehow get that into my painting, just a little, like this one is a very autumn scene. If I can just get that slight crispness that I feel when I'm out on a walk on an autumn day and, and kind of feel those, those leaves and that, that little crunch, you know, underneath your feet, you know, that feeling, everyone knows that feeling. Can I relay that into my painting? Let's see. Yeah. You know, um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about when I'm painting. I, I know the feeling and I know, I know what I'm seeing when I have that feeling. Yeah. So can I give someone else that feeling when they look at my work? Yeah, that's interesting. Cause I, it's exactly, it's exactly what I was thinking yesterday. I was uh, laying in a painting, um, of my daughter in uh, a sort of misty, uh, kind of a dark uh, sorry uh um stormy day and mm. and the the whole motivation the whole every decision i'm making as i'm putting down paint is relative to that feeling mm-hmm. it's it's um it doesn't have any i i found that i didn't think at all does this tree look like a tree? Mm, does it look mm-hmm. like that tree? Does it, uh, um, is it, does it work as a tree? It mm-hmm. was more, does it work relative to this feeling that I'm trying yeah. to get that heaviness yeah. of mood or whatever. Yeah. And, um, I, I think that that is a really important thing to touch on because, um, if, if there's, if there's something pivotal that's missing in the academic, um, mm-hmm. conversation, it's that motivation. Right. I feel like that's the professional mindset. If mm. you're standing in your studio and you are, you know, making paintings um, and all you're thinking about is, all you're thinking about is, does this look like that? Does it, uh, or, or, or the technical issues of turning form or, or whatever. Um, I feel like it's, you're still, you know, right. um, have some maturing to do relative to, um, capturing something more poignant, something sure. more, um, feeling driven, emotionally sure. driven. Um, so that makes so much sense to me. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I see that in your work. Um, what would you say, what would you say are your biggest obstacles right now, uh, in making your work? I mean, you just had a baby. Yeah, so that's so a this huge is a huge obstacle. Yeah. And I was incredibly sick my entire pregnancy. I was throwing up multiple times sometimes Jeez. every day. <laughs> so I I had a really hard time painting then. Um, and so the production slowed way down, um, which was really sad because I felt like I had just turned this corner and I was just starting to establish myself. And I was getting these pieces that I was really happy with and, and wanted to show. And, you know, I was getting um, some had, recognition. And, yeah, you just won the uh, second place in yeah. the National Oil Painter. What is it? Uh, the OPA, the Oil Painters of America. Oil Painters of yeah. America. Yeah, which was a huge shock and surprise. And, um, and so, yeah, it was all of a sudden you had all this momentum yeah. and then somebody's like you know what you know what really helped right. continuing this momentum right now uh, is if you got pregnant and right had a baby. and and felt extremely ill the entire nine months <laughs> oh, it was terrible um and so i tried to paint but i, I didn't get a whole lot done unfortunately yeah. um and now he's here and i'm getting like nothing done yeah and it's really, really difficult. I I bring out my paints almost every day still. 
<laughs> just in case. Just habitually, <laughs> you might fall asleep right. for 15 right, minutes. Right, right, yeah. And inevitably, every time I get them out and they, they thaw out because I'm getting them from the freezer, um, that's when he wakes up. <laughs> just as I'm getting ready. <laughs> Yeah. But, but again, I have to remind myself he's two months old. Right. It will change. He will take longer naps, and that's when he I can. He will start crawling. He will start grabbing your cat. Right. Orange. That too. That too. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of what worries me is my studio is my nursery, and that's yeah. a problem for sure. Do you feel like I it can figure it out? But has helped. Um inspire your work even though you're not getting as much working time right. you obviously think about it all the time right. you, you have to be coming up with painting ideas all the time do you feel like uh it's it has um some motivating factors some insp inspiring factors i the thing that i realized more than anything is that i want to really portray to my son the importance of beauty. Um, I I tell him all the time. I'm going to show you all the pretty things. We're going to go on hikes. We're going to we're going to enjoy nature. Um, and he'll be in here and just stare at the walls. What he's actually absorbing, yeah, probably not a whole lot. But he's still at least going to be surrounded by art and and hopefully beautiful things as he grows up. And so hopefully that will kind of instill uh, a sense of importance yeah. around it and um, you get a little teary when you're talking about that <laughs> so cute. i really i really like my son which is so <laughs> weird for me um but his father likes kind of the weird things he he likes david lynch and he likes dolly um which is important david lynch is he's the one that did um twin peaks ah uh, okay yeah super weird stuff yeah uh and who's who's the one talking heads david whatever um yeah he he likes that sort of vibe yeah. which is really important i think to have that balance of okay th this is all the pretty stuff and then this is all the weird stuff that is kind of the more freedom stuff yeah um and so he's he's a really good balance for me and i think for our son uh to yeah just give him a bit more of of a, a balanced view of the world that maybe not the ugly things. I, I don't love the ugly things, but some people do and, yeah. and it's out there and that's fine, but it's okay to like what you like, I think is, is kind of the message I, I want to portray to him. Do you feel like it with the lack of time that you mm -hmm. now have, do you feel like it focuses you more that as you filter through, um, uh, the things that you want to do, mm -hmm. does it help you say, okay, prioritize, say, this is the painting that has to be made and these maybe I'll get to, but, um, do you feel like it's helped in that way? Um, once I start painting, I'm sure it will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In a few months when right. let's, let's revisit this in right. a few months. I do have a painting that the gallery, uh, specifically asked for. And so I'm like, okay, I, that obviously I have to do it. If he thinks that he can sell it, I'll do it. Yeah. Uh, because of course money is always an issue for artists. Um, but then there's other paintings like this one here. I, I started before he was born, but I want to do it. I want to finish it. I don't really enjoy where it is right now um, for various reasons, but I guess I should hold it this way, shouldn't I? Um, but I want to figure it out. Yeah. even though the flowers are long gone by now. Um, so do you, yeah. do you feel like you've painted flowers enough where you can invent quite a bit? Or... Uh, I feel like I invent quite a bit anyway. <laughs> yeah. Even Honestly. if they're in front of you. Yeah. yeah. I'm not looking for that particular flower, that moment in that flower. I'm looking for kind of a series of moments in that yeah. flower. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And so some people, they try to do everything that they can to, control that flower in that moment um and i i let them just open and just have their natural rhythms yeah uh, and that's kind of what i'm responding to in any of my work is what are those natural rhythms what I, what can i grasp from that yeah so. so you touched on money being an issue for every artist i think that's something i'm really interested in um 
hopefully I can talk to a lot of people about, but it is a, it's kind of a, can be a touchy subject. Mm. I don't want to push people into too many uncomfortable sure. places in the conversation, but I, it, it is a reality that we all have to face. Um, and uh, so what, how do you feel like money for you uh, uh, determines what you paint? Does it have any determining factor? Do you not think about that at all? Is it really uh, purely based on, you know, in some cases what the gallery is asking for, right. in some cases what collectors are asking, right. asking for, uh, what's previously sold, what maybe didn't get as much attention, right. uh, the size of what we do, uh, subject matter. Um, I mean, there's so many things that go into uh, making us decide what we paint and how large we paint it, how complex we paint. Sure. Uh, um, how much, how much do finances factor into your thinking when you're when you're designing paintings? Probably not as much as it should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, luckily I have a husband who works full time. Uh, he doesn't make a lot of money. That's why. I, we're here in this small room. Um, I would love to have my own studio, beautiful, natural, north light, et cetera, et cetera. But we're in a rental and it's a two bedroom. And so this is the situation we're in. Um, and part of me is like, well, if I just did this with my work, I could hopefully make some more money. But I've never been a like a hot seller, I guess. Uh, and part of that is I'm still at the beginning of my career. Yeah. Um, and so what actually sells a lot of the time, I don't really have a whole lot of patterns. I know that florals are popular, but that doesn't mean that they're going to sell. Yeah. Every time I post one of my florals, people really like them. But how many have I actually sold? I still have a couple down in the gallery that I sent a couple months ago that, yeah. I mean, they're strong works. One of them is the second place award winner. Yeah. It's been in two galleries now and still hasn't sold. Yeah. It's hard to predict. So, that. yeah. So I can't really say I'm going to paint this specifically. So it will sell. All I can do is say, I really like this. I'm going to paint, paint it the best I can. And yeah. hopefully it will. Yeah. And usually it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Travis Schlott. <laughs> Uh, who everyone should know if you don't know him look up look him up uh, he's brilliant but he said uh, something like make sure that the paintings you make um, that you really love them because mm -hmm. you'll probably end up they'll probably end up on your wall right at some point. <laughs> yeah it's um, I, early in my career uh, I, I found myself not chasing the dollar but um, what I realized uh, it was it was a fear because mm -hmm. I had kids now sure. you have a kid and there's right. certain responsibilities yeah. and I felt like standing at my easel um just to when I I'm gonna have to go home tonight mm -hmm. and I'm gonna have to face my wife I'm gonna have to face my kids and right. I feel like I have to be responsible today sure. and in order to be responsible I have to be doing something that's going to uh help make money and put right. food on the table and right. that's my role uh and right. um for a long time, I was doing small works that I was guessing at what would sell. Mm -hmm. I was sure. trying to figure out, um, you know, what what might win an award or mm -hmm. or what would do well in in this particular competition. Or uh, and and I really feel like it undermined the quality of my work because mm -hmm. I also was trying to turn out a ton of stuff. Right. I had that one point like eight galleries and I felt like Ooh. every gallery oh, needed like six to 12 Jeez. paintings. And I, uh, um, and that really, uh, I feel like I could it was never a, do that. It was a hard awakening to realize yeah. that I had been, because I was painting out of the fear of making or not making money. Uh, I had actually been doing really poor work, mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, yeah, it was a hard thing. I pulled out of galleries. I, it was it was really hard there for a while to to adjust that mindset and um, start painting just the things that I felt like mattered. Right. Uh, putting as much time into it as I felt like it needed. I still struggle with that. Sure. You know, you finish something and you think it's amazing, but you put it away for a month or right. two, bring right. it back out, and you see a million things you can still right. work on. So I'm trying to have that discipline, but it's hard to do. Um, money is such a it's such a a, a, a necessary evil yeah. but, but it's hard to not let it filter into how you make a decision when right. you're in front of the easel right 
Um, so what would you say, um, I mean, if you could give advice to young artists, you're kind of, like you said, at the beginning of your mm -hmm. career, so you're in the midst of um, this evolution and this maturing and understanding the business of it, which is oh. huge. Uh, um, I, I think they should teach that in the academy, actually, yeah. in school. In anywhere, yeah. How, yeah, how, how to run a business. Yeah. Because there's, I swear, I'm going to get audited and I'm just going to be like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I, I probably owe you <laughs> all sorts of money. Well, it can't be that much because I don't sell that much. But still, I'm going to owe you more than I can afford. So I, I don't know. <laughs> Because I don't, I don't know how to do like the taxes side of it. Yeah. Uh, it's all so new and different and foreign to me. I don't think about that. Um, and then just, yeah, running a business and being, being that business guy is weird. Yeah. Because I, I didn't study for that. I studied to be a painter. And on top of that, being an introvert. And, right. Yeah. And we're also sort of self-conscious. Yeah. And you have to also be your own self-promoter yeah um which you know if you finish something it's easy to throw it up on instagram or whatever but right. but it's really hard to toot your own yeah. horn and, yeah. and try to and there's a lot to great. marketing that it's the artists really don't know no. because they've never studied it yeah they they know how to do their work and it's so uncomfortable too because <laughs> so if, I, uncomfortable. <laughs> if i when i talk about your work it's easy because i'm just a fan i could i could you know elevate it to the skies and i don't and I feel good about that. Mm. But if I talk about my stuff, right, I'll yeah. tell you everything that's wrong with it. Right, right. Uh, it's really hard to to uh, be that self promoter right. when yeah. uh, it's just a very uncomfortable thing. It is really uncomfortable. Um, so if you could, uh, if you had an ideal patron, and I'm hoping uh, eventually um, these podcasts will will be listened to by art collectors as well. That'd be wonderful. Um, um, if you had your ideal patron or the ideal uh, situation that gave you ultimate freedom to paint whatever you want, if you could do whatever you wanted outside of the need of money, that was no longer a, a, an issue. Um, what would that be like? What what kind of projects would you be working on? Um, um, I mean, where's in 10 years? What's your hope? What, where are you going to be and, and what do you kind of hope for yourself? I, I would love to be in the northeast or northwest. Um, I find the landscape beautiful up there and, and just looking at it, just incredibly inspiring to be in. Um, so I would love to be outside of Utah. I would love to have my own studio that's a sizable <laughs> you know studio with that natural north light um i i have an idea for a series of figure paintings that i can't accomplish in this size of studio because i can't get a model in here um i don't have the right light for it etc cetera, etc cetera. um and so i would love to work on that but ultimately i think i'll still at my heart and core be a still life painter and i'll mm. be doing what i'm doing now yeah. So I have bigger ideas for paintings, but they're not necessarily still lives. Bigger uh, in, in scope, you mean size, bigger in uh, complexity. Um, yeah. Are you working at a comfortable size right now? Do you, do yeah, you I tend wish to work, you could work a little I bit larger? I tend to work a bit smaller. Um, it, it feels right for me. I don't love large still lives anyway. It just feels a little too domineering, maybe. Yeah. Um, and so I, I like the smaller ones, a little bit more comp uh, compact and put it over a, ch a sofa or whatever. And, and it just feels good, you know. Um, but you can get away with something larger with, with figurative work. Uh, so, yeah. And florals, especially doing a large floral piece, I just, it doesn't feel right to me. Yeah. I again I, I like to feel how everything works together and if it gets too big I can't feel that as yeah. well. And there's an intimacy to your still lives that right. kind of that, that that sort of medium to small format really right. fits really yeah. well. Yeah. So so yeah, that's what I'm hoping for in the next ten years is to have these bigger figurative works kind of going but intermingled with the Right, with the but ultimately lives. I am yeah. a still life painter. So yeah. So where can people follow you? Where can people see your work and what's coming up? 
Uh, Katie Lydiard Art is my Instagram handle. Um, I post a lot of masterworks intermingled with my work. Um, and I do that because that's what's inspiring to me. Yeah. And it, it tends to be something that people like yeah. as well. So um, a lot of people follow me just for the masterwork yeah. post, which is fine. I don't care. Uh, but they, they have to suffer through my personal <laughs> work posts as well <laughs> in order to get those. Um, so, yeah, the, that's kind of the best way. Facebook, I feel like, is for old people. That's so <laughs> It's so what? weird. I know it. <laughs> It's weird, but it's Jeez. true. Um, and I don't know what the young people are using these days, but Instagram works. So, uh, yeah, and I'm showing at Brennan Gallery. Uh, I have in a couple, Scottsdale. In Scottsdale, yep. I have TH a couple. Brennan. Yep, I have a couple pieces down there, um, and hopefully, I don't know, within the next year, <laughs> get a couple more down there yeah. if if uh, the baby allows for it. Um, yeah, I think we're in a time with this whole. COVID-19 yeah. lockdown. We don't even know. I mean, it's March 22nd. We have no idea yeah. what's going on. By That's... the time this I actually post this, right? hopefully it'll, I'll post it soon, but um, by the time we post it, it's going to be a different world. Yeah. We, we don't know. Uh, I just talked to Brent, Trey Brennan and, you know, mm -hmm. everybody is just sort of waiting to see. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think scary. things are going to change. I think so. Drama I mean, the gallery world was already changing. Right. And now this, I don't, th you can't even predict yeah. where it's going to go, how long it's going to take. Uh, um, I'm assuming the artists are going to get hit pretty hard. Yeah, I mean, the whole dynamic of the art world is going to yeah. change. It has to. Um, how, we, how we reach people, how we present our work, how we sell our work. But I, or not it people... might not be a, a terrible thing because I feel like the gallery artist relationship was changing anyway yeah. and it, to the to the benefit more of the gallery than the artist um i feel like the artist was putting in a lot more work uh, maybe and maybe not i don't know um but that the gallery was still getting the same amount of recognition and whatever yeah. that they always had despite the artist putting in even more work yeah. if that makes sense and and maybe i shouldn't say that <laughs> but well, I mean, it, it is a with with Facebook, Instagram. It yeah. just changed. I mean, the yeah. the way we present our work, the how people are able to access it, um, the accessibility of individuals yeah. for collectors to go directly right. to artists. Right. Um, but now, I think um, you know, who who knows what's going to happen? Are going to are people going to tear their money out of the stock market? Are they going right. to put it into art still? Or is there going to be like a 2008 right. dip? I mean, 2008 right. through 2010, 11. Right. Uh, um, it just, the, those, uh, the collector market changed dramatically right. then. And I think this is going to be a huge shift. Uh, yeah. uh, we, uh, none of us have any idea no. what's in store, but no. we're going to have to be pretty creative. Right, right, right. About how we show and sell our work. Yeah. It took me a long time to really settle on a gallery to actually show with. And finally, uh, you know, I'm showing with Brennan and, and now it's changing again. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I wanted a gallery that I felt like I could really get a good relationship with and, and you know, kind of build up. Uh, you know, both of us, you know, of course, mutually, exclu mutually beneficial right. relationship. And, and now it's like, ah, yeah. <laughs> how, how's it going to change? Yeah, it's insane. But, but we'll see. I don't know. It's scary out there. Um, I went to the mall. I had to exchange something uh, as a gift um, and everything was closed. And it was yeah. the eeriest feeling. There were like maybe two shops actually open. And I was like, holy cow. Because being at home all day, I don't really see it, right? You know, but being out, it's scary. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for hanging out. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime. Go check out Katie's website. What is your? You didn't say your website. I didn't say my website. It's katielidiardart.com. Katielidiardart.com. Mm -hmm. Same katielidiardart for your Instagram yep. handle. Yep. Check Katie out. Thank you for joining us. And that's it. Thanks. Thanks. We can't do that. We can't do that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Cool. Cool. We did it. We did it. How, how do you feel? Was that really only an hour?